Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me out today. Uh, it's nice to come to the other end of the portage once in a while to <laughs> see what the people a little higher altitude are, are doing. Pontiac's War, um, really the, the impetus for putting together this presentation came uh, with the 250th anniversary of this event. And uh, the War of 1812 has often been called the Forgotten War, but uh, if you really want to think think hard about it, Pontiac's War is a really forgotten conflict. Um, not many people know very much about it. It's sandwiched in between the French and Indian War, which is far better known, and of course after it comes the American Revolution. Uh, Pontiac's War also um, fought largely on the frontiers. Uh, so. Uh, except for perhaps Devil's Hole, uh, the engagement there, uh, most people around here don't know really what Pontiac's War was about. So I thought we'd put together this PowerPoint, um, just kind of go over the causes and the, the bigger picture uh, about the war, and then talk specifically about what was happening right here in the Niagara region. Start off with a quote from Lieutenant Colonel William Browning, who is commanding Fort Niagara. Uh, he made this quote in the summer of 1764. Browning wrote, so difficult it is to prevent such accidents in so extended a carry place. And unless peace is established, I fear the portage of provisions and provender will be difficult and at any rate require many hands. He's talking about the difficulty the British are having getting supplies around the portage. Um, their real focus is trying to resupply and relieve Detroit. And the portage, of course, is that weak link in an otherwise waterborne commerce system. And we're going to get into that in, in just a minute. Start off with that. Our story really begins in July of 1759 when the British capture Fort Niagara. It's uh, the fifth year of the French and Indian War. Fort Niagara has been a target of the, um, the British since the beginning of the war. The British feel that if Fort Niagara can be captured, the whole uh, French system of the fur trade on the Great Lakes will collapse and the British will be able to move in and, and finally get rid of the French but it takes them a while to accomplish this. By, by 1759, the British lay siege to the fort, and after almost three weeks, uh, the, the fort surrenders, the British take it over, and then the next year, of course, the British proceed to occupy the other French forts that were uh, spread out along the upper Great Lakes. Detroit, Michilimackinac, uh, many, many small outposts that are all over the Great Lakes region. Uh, British garrisons are now marching in, taking over these forts where the French had formerly uh, occupied them. <coughs> so Britain is now controlling this vast new uh, land mass from the Appalachian Mountains all the way over to the Mississippi, up toward Hudson's Bay, which they controlled before this. It's a huge, absolutely huge acquisition for the British Empire. But oftentimes, uh, when you expand too quickly, you find that uh, there are problems that develop. And this man, uh, Jeffrey Amherst, uh, Britain's commander in chief in North America, has to deal with those problems. And he finds that Britain, uh, now that the French are defeated, the French formally uh, sign. Uh, treaty that ends the, the French and Indian War, known as the Seven Years' War, uh, in Europe uh, in early 1763. So the French are knocked out, and it, it's time now to go back to a peacetime defense budget. So uh, Amherst has to retrench in North America. One of the things that Amherst does 
is to cut back on the giving of gifts to Native American allies, Native American neighbors. And now that the French are gone, the British are, are moving in. There's kind of a monopoly. And guess what? It's like when your local Walmart moves into a neighborhood, puts all the small shops out of business, and then raises prices. Uh, I'm not saying they do that, but let's just say <laughs> for hypothetical reasons that that's what happens. So the natives are finding that trade goods upon which they depend for their livelihoods, guns, gunpowder, blankets, clothing, iron tools, knives, hatchets, blankets, all those things that, that they use in their everyday lives are escalating in price. Inflation in the 18th century. Uh, as long as the French and the British were competing for the alliances of native nations, uh, there, was, there were elaborate gift-giving ceremonies. Anytime there was a treaty, you better start off by presenting gifts to those who were invited to the treaty. That really symbolized the seriousness of your intentions. Well, uh, it's time now to retrench, so we're going to cut that out. That's too expensive to maintain that uh, custom. So the gift giving is, is really uh, greatly, greatly reduced. And the, the things that Native people need, they can't buy at the old prices. The prices are escalating as well. So almost right as soon as the British uh, take control, um, grievances begin to surface. Uh, as I said, presents not given or they're, they're doled out in a niggardly fashion. Whereas before, both the British and the French had to be somewhat generous to cement alliances with these nations. British traders are now flooding in to the Great Lakes. They're flooding over the Allegheny Mountains into the Ohio country. And not all of them are honest. Some of them are, are cheating the Native people. And some of the Native folks are, are treated with contempt by British uh, garrisons. The, the British, after all, have won the war, and um, they are, you know, are not treating uh, their native neighbors uh, with, with the respect that the natives feel they deserve, because they, they, of course, weren't defeated. The French were defeated, but the native people were not. The British, however, view it in a different light. They think they've defeated everyone. <coughs> and, of course, the intrusion of settlers. Now that the war is over, Settlers are moving in. Right here in the Niagara region, the natives see the construction of a house on the portage, a trader's house. And so uh, this is really a sign that the British are going to begin to move in. But I think that a lot of the native people really thought that after the British uh, drove the French out of Fort Niagara, that they would destroy the fort and withdraw back east of the mountains. <laughs> and that just did not happen. It didn't happen really in many places on the frontier. The French are still here. They're not in control anymore, but there are many, many French traders still actively trading in the upper country. And they're not necessarily happy about the British occupation, so they're agitating a little bit behind the scenes. And at the same time, there's a nativist movement uh, a Delaware prophet by the name of Neolin uh, has visions, and he is advocating that Native people return to Native ways and give up uh, these trading practices with the Europeans, go back to their own Native ways of bows and arrows rather than guns, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so all of these factors are swirling around at the end of uh, the French and Indian War, and pretty soon there's trouble. Two, uh, two Senecas really start this uh, process, and some historians really don't even call this Pontiac's War. They, they, uh, they say Gaia Sutta was far more instrumental in promoting uh, this than, than Pontiac, but Gaia Sutta and uh, Panadoris they carry uh, belts from this region over to Detroit to urge an uprising against their new British neighbors. Captain Donald Campbell 
uh, at Detroit writes, I have been lately alarmed with reports of the bad designs of the Indian nations against this place and the English in general. <laughs> so Kayasuda's efforts to stir up trouble are really discovered, and things kind of simmer down after that. But rumors persist, and the rumors are that Fort Niagara is threatened, Fort Pitt in, in Pittsburgh is threatened. So how does Amherst react to this? Well, he bans the trade of ammunition to the natives. If they're going to cause trouble, we're just not going to provide any ammunition to them. Well, they need the ammunition for hunting because many, many native families survive from the products of their, their hunting. So cutting off the ammunition just makes the situation worse. Amherst himself has absolutely no respect for native people. He views them as a nuisance. Uh, so he's not the guy to be handling uh, a crisis like this. April 1763, a couple years have passed since the first rumblings, and things have been building uh, a little bit of momentum. Uh, an Ottawa named Pontiac holds a council with Ottawa's Potawatomi's and Wyandots outside of Detroit, and he uh, forges an alliance uh, with the purpose of capturing Detroit. This is what Detroit looks like. Uh, in 1763 or 1764, the General Motors plant is right here. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's, it's, a, it's a stockaded village, essentially. Uh, it still looks like it did when the French were there because the British haven't been in control of it for very long at this point. So Pontiac decides to take Detroit by surprise. And this makes a lot of sense because... Uh, you know, it's just not too smart to just storm uh, uh, an enemy outpost that's that's fortified, um, where there is artillery, you know, blow you apart. So stealth is a far smarter strategy. But the fort's commandant, a man by the name of Henry Gladwin, is alerted that this is going to happen. And he foils the plot by having all of his men uh, on alert, muskets loaded. Uh, so the plot fails. They are unable to capture Detroit by stealth. And so they decide, the native uh, alliance decides to uh, lay siege to the fort. Uh, and this goes on for several months. Starts in May. And I'm, I'm starting with Detroit because it has a lot to do with what was going on right here on the Niagara Portage. Because Detroit, crops were grown in Detroit. It was, uh, it was an agriculturally productive area, but it still depended upon supplies from the more subtle parts of North America. And the supply routes coming across Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, or up the Mohawk to Oswego, and then along the same route, one route along the southern shore of Lake Erie, the other one along the northern shore. So it's a long, long supply line, but fortunately for the British, most of that supply line is water. And the British are maintaining sailing vessels on both Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, so they can carry uh, these supplies and reinforcements most of the distance. So. Um, one of these parties of troops that's on its way to Detroit uh, is under the command of a, a guy by the name of Lieutenant Kyler. And they land uh, at Point Calais on Lake Erie's North Shore, May 13, 1763. At this point, no one back east really knows anything's wrong at Detroit. And Kyler's men land here, and they're attacked. And some survive and get away, and that's how news gets back that there's something wrong at Detroit. So over the course of the next few weeks, uh, war parties seize most of the British forts in the Great Lakes region. Mm -hmm. And you can see there, they, they take there's a fort at Sandusky that they capture, Miami, St. Joseph, Yachtanon, Michilimackinac, all of these forts. 
up here fall one after the other. And then uh, in June, uh, the forts that really connect Fort Niagara to Fort Pitt in what's now northwestern Pennsylvania, Fort Presque Isle, the Book, and Venango, they all fall uh, as well. These are small garrisons, just a handful of soldiers, and in most cases they didn't know what was coming. Uh, so they're, they're quickly seized, and some of the men are killed, some are taken prisoner, uh, and the fort's for the most part destroyed. Probably the most famous incident of Pontiac's War is, is how the natives captured <clears throat> Fort Mackinac in uh, northern Michigan. They staged a lacrosse game. And at some point, the lacrosse <laughs> ball was thrown into the fort, and all of the players ran in after it. And women were inside the fort with sawed-off muskets under their blankets. And as the players rushed in to the interior of the fort, much to the mirth of the, the sentries who were standing there watching this, all of a sudden, tomahawks are grabbed, muskets grabbed, and within, of course, a very short time, uh, the fort is captured. Fort Pitt is besieged. Uh, fort Pitt is where Pittsburgh is today. That's a rendering of it. They don't capture Fort Pitt, but basically of the big forts on the, on the frontier, Niagara and Pitt are about the only ones that, that don't fall to uh, these native war parties. Fort Pitt is linked to the eastern settlements by a very rough road over the mountains in Pennsylvania, a road called the Forbes Road. And a couple of other forts along this road are attacked but not captured. Fort Bedford and Fort Ligonier um, both attacked. Settlers from those areas run into those forts for protection. Uh, and the situation becomes very, very desperate for these besieged uh, garrisons. So Fort Niagara is, is really too strong for a direct attack. Too many men, uh, fortifications, while they're deteriorated, are you know, too, too strong. But if you wander very far away from the fort, uh, you're risking your life. Hmm. Uh, parties of woodcutters are attacked and killed. Uh, messengers that have been dispatched from the fort to take messages uh, you know, up to the upper landing, for example, are waylaid and killed. So it's very, very dangerous to go uh, outside of the fort, uh, very far, very far from it. Well, Amherst has to do something. And so he's going to organize a relief expedition to try to reach Fort Pitt and, and Detroit. But he doesn't have much to work with. Remember, the, the war is over, and so demobilization is what's going on here. Uh, Regiments are being disbanded, and a lot of the regiments that Amherst has to work with have just returned from, guess where, the C Caribbean, the Siege of Havana, mm -hmm. where they've all got tropical fevers. <laughs> so the, the handful of troops that Amherst does have to deal with this situation are sick. So it's, it's, it's bad. Bad situation. But nonetheless, uh, he devises a two-pronged uh, uh, attack, try to relieve Fort Pitt and Detroit. In the south, he appoints this guy, this, a Swiss mercenary named Henry Bouquet, no relation to Hyacinth Bouquet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, keeping up appearances, fans. I think it's spelled yes. a little differently as well. <laughs> Colonel Henry Bouquet uh, gets orders to relieve Detroit over that Forbes Road that I showed you a, a bit ago in southern Pennsylvania. And this man, Captain James Dalyell, gets instructions to relieve Detroit. Dalyell is Amherst's aide. Uh, and his portrait's there, along with a, a picture of the, of the village. Bouquet, um, Bouquet is on his way to Fort Pitt when he is attacked by a goodly number of, of native warriors 
but he holds his ground and he's actually able to hold on and make it through to Fort Pitt. He fights the Battle of Bushy Run in August of 1763, which is a, a famous victory where Highlanders uh, basically defeat um, the, the native people who have tried to stop the Hupeus column. This is one of the few instances where the British Army is actually able to uh, survive uh, an action of this kind in the, in the woods. Hmm. Dalio, on the other hand, doesn't fare so well. Dalio impresses me as uh, a real go-getter. So he decides when he gets to Detroit that he's going he's gonna to attack the native villages that are, or the native encampment, rather, that's to the north. So he starts out at night and he uh, marches right up the road toward these native, this native encampment. And it isn't long before he's cut off from uh, the fort and his men are pretty much decimated. He himself is killed. Uh, so this is a, a, another defeat for the British at Detroit. The remnants of his column retreats back into the village and once again uh, the siege continues. At this point in the story, resupplying Detroit is absolutely critical. And here's the problem. This is the weak link in the whole system. Because it's, it's difficult for the native people to attack British sailing ships. They have artillery. And a load of grape shot can do a lot to a birch bark canoe. So it's going to be very difficult for them to attack the supply ships that are carrying the supplies and the soldiers to Detroit. However, here on the portage, all of those supplies and troops have to go over land. Um, you've got Fort Niagara on one end, and you've got Fort Little Niagara up here, which uh, 1763, they're beginning to call it Fort Schlosser instead. So you've got these two posts, and in between, you've got this long portage that is very, very exposed. Hence, the quote we began with from Browning, uh, that it's going to be, peace better be established soon because it's going to be very, very difficult to move very much over this portage. Amherst organizes uh, the platoons. These are basically um, provisional groups of troops that are taken from different units and organized into provisional uh, uh, companies using what he has to address the situation. And their orders are to come out here and subdue the Senecas and relieve Detroit. One of the powerful tools that the British have at their disposal are two sailing vessels on Lake Erie, the Huron and the Michigan. Because once uh, they get clear of the Niagara Portage, you can sail all the way across Lake Erie to Detroit. However, in August, the sloop Michigan is wrecked at the mouth of 18 Mile Creek. Hmm. And this is a this is 18 Mile Creek. It's near Evans. It's Buffalo's up here, 18 Mile Creek there. It, the ship's caught in a storm and it's blown ashore and wrecked. And miraculously, the, the crew and passengers survive. They come ashore and they build a, a little uh, <coughs> temporary fort on top of the bluff above the mouth of the creek because they're afraid of being attacked. Luckily, they have with them this guy whose name is uh, Lieutenant John Montressor. And he is an engineer, and he leads people ashore. They go up to the top of the bluff, and they build a redoubt, uh, another word for a, a small fortification, at the top of the, the lake shore. And sure enough, on September 3rd, uh, a war party of natives attacks this position, but it holds out. And uh, eventually, the, the natives move on. Now there's going to be an attempt to salvage this ship, uh, which ultimately fails. But they're trying to, to salvage this ship when the next blow happens, and that's uh, Devil's Hole. So put yourself in the place of uh, disgruntled Senecas, people who 
want to see the British gone, how are they going to do? Uh, how are they going to deliver a blow that will um, that will count? Well, Devil's Hole is the perfect place because um, the Portage Road goes very close to the gorge there. Uh, and along most of the portage, uh, travelers described uh, the woods around the Portage Road as like Hyde Park in London. Open woods, big trees, but you can see a long way through the woods because the trees are far apart. So not a very good place for an ambush. But at Devil's Hole, the road comes very close to the river in the gorge, so the sunlight sunlight can get in to that position across the gorge, and there's a lot of underbrush right there. This place to hide. Not much of a place for the defenders to go. So on September 13th, 1763, uh, Seneca warriors, mostly from Geneseo area, lay an ambush along the Portage Road. And uh, along that road comes a train of wagons returning to the lower landing. They're actually headed north. They're not loaded. They're, they're coming back empty. But it doesn't matter, because if they can destroy the, the teams and the wagons, the British will lose the capacity to move stuff over the portage. And it will hurt the defense of Detroit. Uh, these are just, this is just a picture we took of the 250th anniversary, we had some of the 80th foot who were originally there, uh, not the guys, the unit, um, out to commemorate the 250th anniversary. Uh, so September 13th, in most histories you'll see this written down as September 14th. Yes. Um, and uh, my colleague Eric Bloomquist, who studied this in detail, always maintained that it was September 13th which led me to wonder, which is it, 14th or 13th? And so I started reading the original documents. And the September 14th date is used in all the documents that are written by somebody who wasn't here. Amherst refers to it as September 14th. Uh, other British officers that are writing about it from headquarters in New York are referring to it as September 14th. But if you read any of the letters that come out of Fort Niagara, where the officers are actually here, it says September 13th. So I am convinced it was September 13th and not September 14th. Anyway, it helps to be on the scene, I guess. I wouldn't worry about it. Do you recommend that you say 13th? I think 13th is probably it because that's what the guys on the ground are saying. The commanders in, uh, in New York City are saying 14. But I think Eric's right. Um, anyway, this really uh, deals the British a blow. They're, they're actually carrying barrels of provisions over the portage by hand for a little while. It really is a victory for the, the natives. By October, this is a month later, the British get their act back together, and they are going to, uh, they got a relief expedition under Fort Niagara's uh, commander, Major John Wilkins. He has about 670 troops, and they, uh, they're in bateau. Bateau are little wooden rowboats. Not so little. Um, but essentially, a, you know, a bateau can be sailed, a bateau can be rowed, but they're probably rowing up the Niagara River, uh, off of the city where the city of Buffalo is today. Here's Squaw Island, and they get to a place uh, where the river really narrows, just before it goes out into Lake Erie, or before Lake Erie comes into it. Uh, they get to a very narrow spot in the river, and they're fired upon by about 90 native warriors who are up on the high ground. Uh, where the city of Buffalo is today. This is called the Battle of Buffalo Creek, and I bet most Western New Yorkers don't even know about it. Um, this is where it was. Um, if you look at these buildings here, they're 
This is where the native position was. Um, this is the this is 190 here. Rivers over here. This is a little bit longer view. Peace Bridge is here. Wilkins would have been in the river right here when he's fired upon from this side. That's a bateau. So the British land, and they have quite a little firefight, and they, they eventually drive the natives back into the swamps that were buffalo at that time. Uh, but they sustain so many wounded that they have to return to the fort, and the expedition does not continue to Detroit. Wilkins tries again in November. Now, November's getting really late to be on the lakes. And Wilkins is one of these guys that never seems to be successful at anything. And he gets out on Lake Erie on November 7th, and his expedition is wrecked by a storm. So, uh, supplies are getting to Detroit in dribs and drabs, but the major relief expeditions have been frustrated in 1763. But winter also brings the need for Native people to lift the siege of Detroit and go back home and hunt to sustain their families through, through the winter. So the siege, uh, not lifted by the British Army, but <coughs> lifted by Mother Nature, perhaps one, one could say. About this time, November, another blow falls on the portage. Now this is, 1763 is not a good year for uh, the British here on the Niagara. It's a little fort at where Art Park is today in Lewiston called Fort Demler. And it stood just about where this star is, right at the top of the gully. And this is what we think it looks like. It was not really much of a fort. And in, no, uh, in November, uh, a sergeant and ten men sent to bring in wood were attacked. Seven were killed, one man escaping. Another was overtaken by three Indians very near the fort and his head cut off. Um, there are accounts of this where uh, the British inside the fort have a cannon. So they're going to fire the cannon to scare off the, the war party. And when they fire the cannon, the, per the concussion from it knocks a piece of the stockade wall down. So just you know, not a good, not a good situation. Further south uh, in Pennsylvania, you have a lot of raids on frontier settlements, uh, settlers taken captive. Um, there's a lot of uh, the government not really doing much to protect the frontier settlers. So they take it into their hands and they actually go into a, a settlement of Conest peaceful Conestoga Indians and they massacre them. In fact, um, the, the county authorities in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, take the survivors and keep them in the, the community jail, protect them, when these frontier vigilantes called the Paxton Boys actually break into the jail and slaughter the rest. So this is happening on both sides, natives killing settlers, settlers killing natives. Uh, it's, it's an escalating cycle of violence. Well, the British now have to do something. They have to counterattack. And the 1764 campaign is, is what uh, comes out of this. They've got a new commander. Anne Hurst has finally gone back to England. Most people are not sad to see him go. And this man, General Thomas Gage, takes command. Gage is the guy who, you know, about 12 years later, 11 years later, sends the British Army off to Lexington and Concord, so you know, his career does not improve from here, I guess you could say. But uh, Gage is the new commander. Gage is a little more tuned into native diplomacy than his predecessor was. And he follows the, the same tactics that, uh, that Amherst did the year before, but, but Gage has a lot more to work with. He's going to send Bouquet uh, back across Pennsylvania. And Bouquet is going to go all the way out into the Muskingum River in Ohio and subdue the Delaware and the Shawnee. A man named Colonel John Bradstreet will relieve Detroit coming through Niagara. And at the same time, Sir William Johnson, who is the Crown's Indian agent, will convene a huge Native Congress at Fort Niagara uh, to establish peace treaties with the nations 
that are in arms against the British. So this is essentially where those expeditions are going to go in the south and in the north. The man who's going to come through Fort Niagara is John Bradstreet. He's a hero of the French and Indian War. He's born in Nova Scotia. Uh, he uh, was a very, very adept frontier fighter. Uh, he, he beat the French on, on several occasions. He captured Fort Frontenac in uh, 1758. Um, that's where Kingston, Ontario is now. So he's got a good military reputation, and he's known for his logistical expertise. He knows how to move an army from point A to point B, especially by bateau. So well, that's why he's especially cut out for this expedition. So during the winter, William Johnson holds a council at Johnson Hall, and he asks, uh, he sends uh, representatives to ask Native nations to join him at Niagara in July for a big peace conference. This is the message he sends. My friends and brothers, I am come with this belt from our great father, Sir William Johnson. He desired me to come to you as his ambassador and tell you that he is making a great feast at Fort Niagara, that his kettles are all ready and his fires ignited. He invites you to partake of the feast in common with your friends, the Six Nations, who have all made peace with the English. He advises you to seize this opportunity of doing the same as you cannot otherwise fail of being destroyed. For the English are on the march with a great army, which will be joined by different nations of Indians. So it's kind of a combination of carrot and stick tactics here. You know, join us. The six nations have made peace. And if you don't join us, you'll be destroyed. That's what Johnson's me message is. Johnson had the advantage that most of the, the five nations to the east of the Senecas <coughs> were not involved in the rebellion, per se. It was mainly the Senecas. So he is able to get the Mohawks, in particular, and the, uh, some of the other nations to actually go with him to try to subdue the rebellion, which is key. I'll get into that in a minute. Bradstreet's got 1,200 men. And I, I've listed them there. Uh, most interesting is, you know, it's British regulars, but Men from New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey uh, come out on this expedition. They have boatmen, and they have 250 native warriors that come along on the British side to fight against native warriors who are in rebellion. And this is, uh, this is a tactic that Johnson uses again and again to try to divide and conquer. So July and August, there's this huge peace conference at Fort Niagara. 1,700 Native Americans convene at Fort Niagara, and Johnson reaches agreements with many of the nations that are there. But he does it very cleverly. He doesn't meet with them all at once. He makes separate deals with each nation. Again, divide and conquer. Each nation must sign its own. The last thing he wants is a unified you know, Native movement. So he does it all nation by nation. One of the things that the Senecas are forced to relinquish is a four-mile corridor on both sides of the river to the British Crown. And you can see here the, on, the, on our side, on the U.S. side, um, that's when this big transfer of land from the Senecas to, the, to Johnson and then the British Crown takes place. He gives out 25,000 pounds worth of presents, but many of the hostile nations did not attend the conference. So there still you know, needs to be a military expedition to settle things. Well, while Johnson's holding this big press con or, yeah, peace conference, not holding a press conference, while he's, uh, while he's holding this big peace conference, Bradstreet is moving his army over the portage. But, you know, they have to be careful because they don't want to move the army on into the Ohio country when there's 1,700 natives at Fort Niagara. So they, they kind of hold the army back and wait for the peace conference to wind down before they fully move the army 
over the portage. Moving an army over this portage is a time-consuming process in and of itself. But uh, they're going to be, they've gotten their army over the portage by August 8th. They're at Fort Schlosser, which is depicted here. And they're going to, from here, go by, by boat um, along Lake Erie to try to get to Detroit. While this is going on, this is a busy year on the portage. They realize that one of the problems with the portage is that it's this long, exposed road that offers many, many opportunities for ambushes. So they're thinking, if we fortify this road, it will, it will enable us, it will be much safer moving goods over the portage. So our good friend Montressor, remember our friend the engineer, who, uh, who saved his people on September 3rd, 1763, he builds a series of redoubts that are 600 to 1,000 yards apart. And these are places of refuge in case uh, of an attack. Uh, you can run to them. They're very simple. They're just a wooden stockade. You can see an elevation there. It's a sharpened log. And inside, there's a firing step and basically a hollow log square. You can just get in there and, and take refuge in case you're attacked. He also finishes up a device called the Cradles, uh, which is referred to as a mechanic engine at that point. And that's uh, some sort of an incline plane that's designed to haul stores up the escarpment. Not a new idea. It's been talked about for, for quite some time. But it's, it gets finished during uh, this summer season and is working uh, apparently, it's working okay. Was that in one location or several? It, it was it was in stages because they had to come up out of the gully and then they had to go up over the escarpment from there. I'm going to show you uh, some. Well, some people refer to it as the first railroad in North America. That's not true. No. Well, some people do refer to it that way, but I, I agree with you. I I was. Uh, most rail historians don't credit that. That's what I mean. Yeah. Thank you. Most rail historians don't look at it that way. I'm not going to say one way or the other. <laughs> but here's some fanciful depictions of it. Um, here it is going from the river all the way up to the top. Uh, here's another view of the same thing right up the top. And it wasn't that way. It was more gradual than that in a, a couple of stages. This looks like, uh, if you've ever ridden the incline plane on the Mount Washington and Pittsburgh, that's what that looks like to me. Uh, so those really aren't too realistic. Was it driven by gravity? Partially, yeah. They had a, apparently a big windlass at the top that helped as well. But the fortification program goes further than that. Um, they also build a fort. Before this, the British had at Buffalo Creek, they had storehouses. Uh, and that was pretty much their base on Lake Erie at this end of the lake. Well, they had to abandon that, so they're going to build a new fort. They're going to do it over on the, the western shore. And so they build Fort Erie. And one of the great leaders of the American Revolution that came to Niagara in 1764 to, to help with this project is Israel Putnam. Many of you probably heard of him. He was a general in the Continental Army early in the Revolution. And Fort Erie uh, looks like this. This is not the Fort Erie that you go to today. Actually, I think this is probably out under the lake waters of Lake Ontario now. It was south of, of where the present Fort Erie is. It, it's a later, uh, later construction. So they fortified the portage. They built some sort of an incline mechanic engine to bring uh, goods up the escarpment. They fortified the uh, Lake Erie end of things. They fortified Navy Island, so they're in a much better position now uh, for defense. And pretty quickly, these fortifications prove of great value. In April, uh, uh, there's a report, uh, a man of the 80th was scalped at Niagara and a party sent after the enemy who came up with seven men and a boy, and they, according to their custom, made their escape with their scalp. So that was, that was in April before 
uh, any of this fortification was completed. But on June 25th, uh, we see eight little posts are established. But at noonday on the 23rd, an artilleryman, one of the 80th, fired upon by two Indians, the artillerymen killed and scalped, although Stedman and others on horseback had just passed severally by. Stedman, of course, had the, the portage, ran the portage. So that, these incidents continue. But on July 15th, uh, I think this is a good story to tell your grandkids if this had been you. <laughs> July 15th, a few days ago, a soldier was fired at by an Indian on the carrying place. The ball struck the haversack on his back. The things therein prevented it its entering his body, and he returned the fire and made his escape to one of the little posts. <laughs> so the haversack on his back is this. So he's fired at. The musket ball hits this. He probably has something in there that stops it. He runs into one of these little redoubts, and he survives. Old well, Bouquet has a bit more success in the south. He marches all the way to the Muskingum and forces the natives to uh, sign a peace treaty, and they have to return all the captives that they have taken uh, over the years. And in many cases, this was a heart-rending situation because these small children had been captured, brought up by native people as natives, and they fit into these communities and were now forced to return to white civilization. And in many cases, they, some of them didn't want to because they've been small children and they had grown accustomed to the native way of life. But that was the reality of the situation. The final peace treaties are signed at Oswego in 1766, even though hostilities end in 1764. Um, but the treaty signed in 1766, and for the most part, the frontier returns to a peaceful state. Pontiac himself, who is credited with... Uh, creating so much of his trouble, particularly around Detroit, is murdered uh, near Cahokia, Illinois, in 1769 by a, 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 another native. Uh, these are some 19th century depictions of Pontiac's murder. So he, uh, he ends up uh, in not very uh, good condition either. Political legacies of this war. Uh, Native settler antagonism. This really began in the French and Indian War. Pontiac's War just exacerbates this situation. If there is hate, if there is race hatred that is being generated by this frontier conflict, Pontiac's War just throws gasoline on this fire. And that continues for many, many years uh, in American history. Proclamation line of 1763. The British are looking for a solution to this problem. So they declare a line pretty much along the Allegheny Mountains. Uh, west of that is reserved for the native nations, so the settlements will be confined to the eastern seaboard. Well, this uh, greatly alarms many uh, colonial Americans because if they had been promised land west of those mountains uh, for their service in the French and Indian War, so this seems like the British government is is changing its mind and, and pulling the carpet out from under them. Uh, and of course, the British have, don't have the power to enforce this. So the settlers continue to cross the mountains, but it creates some political ill will between the colonies and the home government, which we see what happens in another 10 years. Uh, third thing that happens is frontier residents begin to resent uh, the, the eastern governments and their inability to protect them. And this creates all kinds of political turmoil within the colonies themselves, particularly Pennsylvania, uh, where the, the raiding was a lot worse um, than it was further north. I can't see very well from here. Can you show Washington on that map? Can you go back? Is it Baltimore? It's Baltimore, Philadelphia. Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Boston. Wilmington. Wilmington. Yeah. So Pontiac's War has a big legacy, even for us today. Physical legacies. There are still things around that are related to the war. At 
Fort Pitt, there's still an original building from 1764. It's called the Block, Block House. You can still see it today. It's run by the DAR. Fort Niagara, the redoubts, the two redoubts were built after this war, but in response to this war. Because the British thought, we only have a few soldiers to defend the fort. We need a better way than having these huge walls that require hundreds of men uh, to man them. So they built these two redoubts. Uh, instead, 25 men in a redoubt could pretty much protect the fort's walls. And the third place you can go to experience Pontiac's War is Bushy Run Battlefield, uh, east of Pittsburgh, uh, again in Pennsylvania. Well, you know, there's no real conflict in American history that Hollywood does not get into the act. And I'd like to, this is kind of a grim topic, so I'd like to kind of end the program today with, on, a, on a little bit lighter note. Uh, Hollywood gets into the act with a movie called The Unconquered, Cecil B. DeMille, no less. And uh, I think you can tell from the artwork here uh, what kind of a movie it was. And uh, I think it's especially interesting who played Gaia Sutta in this movie. Boris Karloff. <coughs> So, if you have a chance to watch this, um, it's funny. It's 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 it's, uh, it's an interesting period piece that is uh, it's worth it's worth the watch. But keep in mind that you're not seeing anything that actually happened. Uh, and General Motors gets into the act as well. This ad. Um, most Americans today, I think, I think the only thing that Americans today think about when they hear the name Pontiac is is the car. And um, Pontiac, obviously named after Pontiac, but um, yeah, what can I say? <laughs> this is a 1950s advertisement and. I guess people in the 1950s had different thought patterns. That they had today. <laughs> so I'll leave it. I'll leave it go with that. Thank you very much for thank you. Any questions? <laughs>